Hello. I'm going to read you a story by Muriel Spark called The Black Madonna. This is a story written in 1958. So we need to remember that context when we're listening to this story. There's going to be, there are going to be words in the story that we probably would not use today. Uh, certainly not in, in Britain and I would hope not, not anywhere else. Um, what we are doing at the moment with a few of my groups is we are exploring issues of race and we are trying to look beyond um, the surface really to see what is the general context resulting in um, intolerance, inequality, um, discrimination um, and instances of um, negative othering. So we're looking uh, quite deep into the characters of the stories that we're reading in that respect to consider their context, their history, how they probably, uh, what what leads them to end up in, um, in an episode of racism. So I um, hope you enjoy this story. It's by Muriel Spark and it's called The Black Madonna. When the Black Madonna was installed in the Church of the Sacred Heart, the bishop himself came to consecrate it. His long purple train was upheld by the two curliest of the choir. The day was favoured suddenly with thin October sunlight as he crossed the courtyard from the presbytery to the church as the procession followed him chanting the litany of the saints. Five priests in vestments of wide heavy silk interwoven with glinting threads, four lay officials with straight red robes, then the confraternities and the tangled columns of the Mother's Union. The new town of Whitney Clay had a large proportion of Roman Catholics, especially among the nurses at the new hospital. And at the paper mills too, there were many Catholics drawn inland from Liverpool by the new housing estate. Likewise with the cannon factories, the Black Madonna had been given to the church by a re recent convert. It was carved out of bog oak. They found the wood in the bog had been there hundreds of years. They sent for the sculptor right away by phone. He went over to Ireland and carved it there and then. You see, he had to do it while it was still wet. Looks a bit like contemporary art. Nah, it's not contemporary art. It's old-fashioned. If you'd ever seen contemporary work, you'd know it was old-fashioned. Looks like contemp... It's old-fashioned. Else how did it get sanctioned to be put up? It's not so nice as the Immaculate Conception at Lourdes. That lifts you up. Everyone got used eventually to the Black Madonna with her square hands and straight carved draperies. There was a movement to dress it up in vestments, or at least a lace veil. She looks a bit gloomy, father, don't you think? No, said the priest, I think it looks fine. If you start dressing it up in cloth, you'll spoil the line. Sometimes people came from London, especially, to see the Black Madonna. And these were not Catholics, they were, said the priest, probably no religion at all, poor souls, though gifted with faculties. They came as if to a museum to see the line of the Black Madonna, which must not be spoiled by vestments. The new town of Whitney Clay had swallowed up the old village. One or two cottages with double dormer windows, an inn called the Tiger, a Methodist chapel and three small shops represented the village. The three shops were already threatened by the council. The Methodists were fighting to keep their chapel. 
Only the double dormer cottages and the inn were protected by the nation and so had to be suffered by the town planning committee. The town was laid out like geometry in squares, arcs to allow for, for the bypass and isosceles triangles breaking off at one point to skirt the old village which from the aerial view looked like a merry doodle on the page. Manders Road was one side of a parallelogram of green bordered streets. It was named after one of the founders of the canning concern Manders Figs in Syrup and it comprised a row of shops and a long high block of flats named Cripps House after the late Sir Stafford Cripps who had laid the foundation stone. In flat 22 on the fifth floor of Cripps House lived Raymond and Lou Parker. Raymond Parker was a foreman at the motor works and was on the management com committee. He had been married for 15 years to Lou, who was 37 at the time that the miraculous powers of the Black Madonna came to be talked of. Of the 25 couples who lived in Cripps House, five were Catholics. All, except Raymond and Lou Parker, had children. A sixth family had recently been moved by the council into one of the six-roomed houses because of the seven children besides the grandfather. Raymond and Lou were counted lucky to have obtained their three-roomed flat, although they had no children. People with children had priority but their name had been on the waiting list for years and some said Raymond had had a pull with one of the councillors who was a director of the motor works. The Parkers were among the few tenants of Cripps House who owned a motor car. They did not, like most of their neighbours, have a television receiver. From being childless, they had been able to afford to expand themselves in the way of taste so that their habits differed slightly and their amusements considerably from those of their neighbours. The Parkers went to the pictures, only when the observer had praised the film. They considered television not their sort of thing. They adhered to their religion, they voted Labour, they believed that the 20th century was the best so far, they assented to the doctrine of an original sin, they frequently applied the word Victorian to ideas and people they did not like. For instance, when a local town councillor resigned his office, Raymond said he had to go. He's Victorian and far too young for the job. And Lou said Jane Austen's book, books were too Victorian. And anyone who opposed the abolition of capital punishment was Victorian. Raymond took the Reader's Digest, a magazine called Motoring and the Catholic Herald. Lou took the Queen, Woman's Own and Life. The daily paper was the News Chronicle. They read two books apiece each week. Raymond preferred travel books. Lou liked novels. For the first five years of their married life, they had been worried about not having children. Both had submitted themselves to medical tests, as a result of which Lou had a course of injections. These were unsuccessful. It had been a disappointment since both came from large, sprawling Catholic families. None of their married brothers and sisters had less than three children. One of Lou's sisters, now widowed, had eight. They sent her a pound a week. The flat in Cripp's house had three rooms and a kitchen. All round them, their neighbours were saving up to buy houses. A council flat, once obtained, was a mere platform in space to further the progress of the rocket. This ambition was not shared by Raymond and Lou. They were not only content, they were delighted. 
with these civic chambers, and indeed took something of an aristocratic view of them, not without a self-conscious feeling of being free, in this particular, from the prejudices of that middle class to which they, as good as, belonged. One day, said Lou, it will be the thing to live in a council flat. They were eclectic as to their friends. Here, it is true, they differed slightly from each other. Raymond was for inviting the Ackleys to meet the Pharaohs. Mr Ackley was an accountant at the electricity board. Mr and Mrs Farrell were respectively a sorter at Manders Figs in Syrup and an usherette at the Odeon. After all, argued Raymond, they're all Catholics. Ah, well, said Lou, but now their interests are different. The Farrells wouldn't know what the Ackleys were talking about. The Ackleys like politics. The Farrells like to tell jokes. I'm not a snob, only sensible. Oh, please yourself, for no one could call Lou a snob, and everyone knew she was sensible. Their choice of acquaintance was wide by reason of their active church membership. That is to say, they were members of various guilds and confraternities. Raymond was a sidesman, and he also organised the weekly football lottery in aid of the church decoration fund. Lou felt rather out of things when the Mother's Union met and had special masses, for the Mother's Union was the only group she did not qualify for. Having been a nurse before her marriage, she was, however, a member of the Nurses' Guild. Thus, most of their Catholic friends came from different departments of life. Others, connected with the motor works where Raymond was a foreman, were of different social grades, to which Lou was more alive than Raymond. He let her have her way, as a rule, when it came to a question of which would mix with which. A dozen Jamaicans were taken on at the motor works. Two came into Raymond's department. He invited them to the flat one evening to have coffee. They were unmarried, very polite and black. The quiet one was called Henry Pierce and the talkative one Oxford St John. Lou, to Raymond's surprise and pleasure, decided that all their acquaintance from top to bottom must meet Henry and Oxford. All along he had known she was not a snob, only sensible, but he had rather feared she would consider the mixing of their new black and their old white friends not sensible. I'm glad you like Henry and Oxford, he said. I'm glad we're able to introduce them to so many people. For the dark pair had, within a month, spent nine evenings at Cripp's house. They had met accountants, teachers, packers and sorters. Only Tina Farrell, the usherette, had not seemed to understand the quality of these occasions. Quite nice chaps, them darkies, when you get to know them. You mean Jamaicans, said Lou. Why shouldn't they be nice? They're no different from anyone else. Yes, yes, that's what I mean, said Tina. We're all equal, stated Lou. Don't forget there are black bishops. Jesus, I never said we were the equal of a bishop, Tina said, very bewildered. Well, don't call them darkies. Sometimes, on summer Sunday afternoons, Raymond and Lou took their friends for a run in their car, ending up at a riverside roadhouse. The first time they turned up with Oxford and Henry, they felt defiant. But there were no objections, there was no trouble at all. Soon, the dark pair ceased to be a novelty. Oxford St John took up with a pretty red-haired bookkeeper, and Henry Pierce, missing his companion, spent more of his time at the Parker's flat. 
Lou and Raymond had planned to spend their two weeks summer holidays in London. Poor Henry, said Lou, he'll miss us. Once you brought him out, he was not so quiet as you thought at first. Henry was 24, desirous of knowledge in all fields, shining very much in eyes, skin, teeth, which made him seem all the more eager. He called out the maternal in Lou, and to some extent the avuncular in Raymond. Lou used to love him when he read out lines from his favourite poems which he had copied into an exercise book. Haste thee, nymph, and bring with thee jest and joyful jollity, sport that. Lou would interrupt, you should say jest, jollity, not yest and yollity. Jest, he said carefully, and laughter, holding both his sides, he continued. Laughter. Hear that, Lou? Laughter. That's what the human race was made for. Those folks that go round gloomy, Lou, they... Lou loved this talk. Raymond puffed his pipe benignly. After Henry had gone, Raymond would, stay, would say what a pity it was such an intelligent young fellow had lapsed. For Henry had been brought up in a Catholic, in a Roman Catholic mission. He had, however, abandoned religion. He was fond of saying, the superstition of today is the science of yesterday. I can't allow, Raymond would say, that the Catholic faith is superstition. I can't allow that. He returned to the church one day. This was with Lou's contribution whether Henry was present or not. If she said it in front of Hen Henry, he would give her an angry look. These were the only occasions when Henry lost his cheerfulness and grew quiet again. Raymond and Lou prayed for Henry, that he might regain his faith. Lou said her rosary three times a week before the Black Madonna. He'll miss us when we go on our holidays. Raymond telephoned to the hotel in London. Have you a single room for a young gentleman accompanying Mr and Mrs Parker? He added, a coloured gentleman. To his pleasure, a room was available and to his relief there was no objection to Henry's colour. They enjoyed their London holiday, but it was somewhat marred by a visit to that widowed sister of Lou's to whom she allowed a pound a week towards the rearing of her eight children. Lou had not seen her sister Elizabeth for nine years. They went to her one day towards the end of their holiday. Henry sat at the back of the car beside a large suitcase stuffed with old clothes for Elizabeth. Raymond at the wheel kept saying, poor Elizabeth, eight kids, which irritated Lou though she kept her peace. Outside the underground station at Victoria Park, where they stopped to ask the way, Lou felt a strange sense of panic. Elizabeth lived in a very downward quarter of Bethnal Green, and in the past nine years since she had seen her, Lou's memory of the shabby ground floor rooms with their peeling walls and bare boards had made a kinder nest for itself. Sending off the postal order to her sister each week, she had gradually come to picture the habitation at Bethnal Green in an almost monastic light. It would be very, very bare, but well scrubbed, spotless and shining with brasso and holy poverty. The floorboards gleamed. Elizabeth was grey-haired, lined but neat. The children were well behaved, sitting down betimes to their broth in two rows along an almost refectory table. It was not till they had reached Victoria Park, that Lou felt the full force of the fact that everything would be different from what she had imagined. It may have gone down since I was last here, she said to Raymond, who had never visited Elizabeth before. 
What's gone down? Poor Elizabeth's pace. Lou had not taken much notice of Elizabeth's dull little monthly letters, almost illiterate for Elizabeth, as she herself always said, was not much of a scholar. James is at another job. I hope that's, I hope that's the finish of that bother. I had my blood pressure there. Was a health visitor, very nice. Also the assistants, they sent my dinner all the time and for the kids home, they call it meals on wheels. I pray to the almighty that James is well out of his bother. He never lets on at 16. They're all the same, never open his mouth, but God's eyes are not shut. Thanks for P.O. You will be rewarded. Your effect sister, Elizabeth. Lou tried to piece together in her mind the gist of nine years such letters. James was the eldest. She supposed he had been in trouble. I ought to have asked Elizabeth about young James, said Lou. She wrote to me last year that he was in, in a bother. There was talk of him being sent away, but I didn't take it in at the time. I was busy. You can't take everything on your shoulders, said Raymond. You do very well by Elizabeth. They had pulled up outside the house where Elizabeth lived on the ground floor. Lou looked at the chipped paint, the dirty windows and torn grey-white curtains and was reminded with startling clarity of her hopeless childhood in Liverpool, from which, miraculously, hope had lifted her and had come true, for the nuns had got her, got her that job, and she had trained as a nurse among white painted beds and white shining walls and tires, hot water everywhere, and debt hall without stint. When she had first married, she had wanted all white painted furniture that you could wash and liberate from germs. But Raymond had been for oak. He did not understand the pleasure of hygiene, of hy hygiene and new enamel paint, for his, his upbringing had been orderly. He had been accustomed to a lounge suite and autumn tints in the front room all his life. And now Lou stood and looked at the outside of Elizabeth's, Elizabeth's place and felt she had gone right back. On the way back to the hotel, Lou chattered with relief that it was over. Poor Elizabeth, she hasn't had much of a chance. I liked little Frances. What did you think of little Frances, Ray? Raymond did not like being called Ray, but he made no objection for he knew that Lou had been under a strain. Elizabeth had not been very pleasant. She had expressed admiration for Lou's hat, bags, bag, gloves and shoes, which were all navy blue, but she had used an accusing tone. The house had been smelly and dirty. I'll show you around, Elizabeth had said in a tone of mock refinement, and they were fo forced to push through a dark, narrow passage behind her skinny form till they came to the big room where the children slept. A row of old iron beds, each with a tumble of dark blanket rugs, no sheets. Raymond was indignant at the sight and hoped that Lou was not feeling upset. He knew very well Elizabeth had a decent living income from a number of public sources and was simply a slut, one of those who would not help themselves. Ever thought of taking a job, Elizabeth? He had said and immediately realised his stupidity. But Elizabeth took her advantage. What do you mean? I'm not going to leave my kids in no nursery. I'm not going to send them to no home. What kids need these days is a good home life and that's what they get. And she added, God's eyes are not shut. In a tone which was meant for him, Raymond, to get at him for doing well in life. Raymond distributed half crowns to the younger children and deposited on the, on the table half crowns for those who were out playing in the street. Going already? 
said Elizabeth in her tone of reproach. But she kept eyeing Henry with interest, and the reproachful tone was more or less a routine affair. You from the States? Elizabeth said to Henry. Henry sat on the edge of his sticky chair and answered, No, from Jamaica, while Raymond winked at him to cheer him. During the war, there were a lot of boys like you from the States, Elizabeth said, giving him a sideways look. Henry held out his hand to the second youngest child, a girl of seven, and said, Come, talk to me. The child said nothing, only dipped into the box of sweets which Lou had brought. Come talk, said Henry. Elizabeth laughed. If she does talk, you'll be sorry you ever asked. She's got a tongue in her head, that one. You should hear her cheeking up to the teachers. Elizabeth's bones jerked with laughter among, among her loose clothes. There was a lopsided double bed in the corner, and beside it a table cluttered with mugs, tins, a comb and brush, a number of hair curlers, a framed photograph of the Sacred Heart, and also, Raymond noticed, what he thought erroneously to be a box of contraceptives. He decided to say nothing to Lou about this. He was quite sure she must have observed other things which he had not, possibly things of a more distressing nature. Lou's chatter on the way back to the hotel had a touch of hysteria. Raymond, dear, she said in her most chirpy West End voice, I simply had to give the poor dear all my next week's housekeeping money. We shall have to starve, darling, when we get home. That's simply what we shall have to do. OK, said Raymond. I ask you, Lou shrieked, what else could I do? What could I do? Nothing at all, said Raymond, but what you've done. My own sister, my dear, said Lou. And did you see the way she had her hair bleached? All streaky, and she used to have a lovely head of hair. I wonder if she tries to raise herself, said Raymond. With all those children, she could surely get better accommodation, if only she... That sort, said Henry, leaning forward from the back of the car, never moves. It's the slum mentality, man. Take some folks I've seen back at home. There's no comparison, Lou snapped suddenly. This is quite a different case. Raymond glanced at her in surprise. Henry sat back, offended. Lou was thinking wildly, what a cheek, him, talking like a snob. At least, Elizabeth's white. The prayers for the return of faith to Henry Pierce were so far answered in that he took a, tuber a tubercular turn which was followed by a religious one. He was sent off to a sanatorium in Wales with a promise from Lou and Raymond to visit him before Christmas. Meantime, they applied themselves to Our Lady for the restoration of Henry's health. Oxford St John, whose love affair with a red-haired girl had come to grief, now frequented their flat, but he could never quite replace Henry in their affections. Oxford was older and less refined than Henry. He would stand in front of the glass in their kitchen and tell himself, man, you're just a big black bugger. He kept referring to himself as black, which of course he was, Lou thought, but it was not the thing to say. He stood in the doorway with his arms and smile thrown wide. I am a black but comely, oh, you daughters of Jerusalem. And once, when Raymond was out, Oxford brought the conversation round to that question of being black all over, which made Lou very uncomfortable, and she kept looking at the clock and dropped stitches in her knitting. Three times a week, when she went to the, the black Our Lady with a rosary to ask for the health of Henry Pierce, she asked also that Oxford St John would get another job in another town, for she did not like to make objections, telling her feelings to Raymond. There were no objections to make that you could put a finger on. 
She could not very well complain to Ox that Oxford was common. Raymond despised snobbery, and so did she. It was a very delicate question. She was amazed when, within three weeks, Oxford announced that he was thinking of looking for a job in Manchester. Lou said to Raymond, do you know there's something in what they say about the bog oak statue and the church? There may be, said Raymond, people say so. Lou could not tell, could not tell him how she had petitioned the removal of Oxford St John. But when she got a letter from Henry Pierce to say he was improving, she told Raymond, you see, we asked for Henry to get back to faith and so he did. Now we asked for his recovery and he's improving. He's having good treatment at the sanatorium, Raymond said. But he added, of course, we'll have to keep up the prayers. He himself, though not a rosary man, knelt before the Black Madonna every Saturday evening after benediction to, play, to pray for Henry Pierce. Whenever they saw Oxford, he was talking of leaving Whitney Clay. Raymond said, he's making a big mistake going to Manchester. A big place can be very lonely. I hope he'll change his mind. He won't, said Lou, so impressed was she now by the powers of the Black Madonna. She was good and tired of Oxford St John with his feet up on her cushions and calling himself a nigger. We'll miss him, said Raymond. He's such a cheery big soul. We will, said Lou. She was reading the parish magazine, which she seldom did, although she was one of the voluntary workers who sent them out, addressing hundreds of wrappers every month. She had vaguely noticed in previous numbers various references to the Black Madonna, how she had granted this or that favour. Lou had heard that people sometimes came from neighbouring parishes to pray at the Church of the Sacred Heart because of the statue. Some said they came from all over England, but whether this was to admire the artwork or to pray, Lou was not sure. She gave her attention to the article in the parish magazine. While not wishing to make excessive claims, many prayers answered and requests granted to the faithful in an exceptional way. Two remarkable cures affected, but medical evidence is, of course, still in reserve. A certain lapse of time being necessary to ascertain permanency of cure. The first of these cases was a child of 12 suffering from leukaemia. The second, while not desiring to create, to create a cultus where none is due, we must remember it is always our duty to honour our Blessed Lady, the dispenser of all graces to whom we owe another aspect of the information received by the Father Rector concerning our Black Madonna is one pertaining to childless couples, of which three cases have come to his notice. In each case, the couple claimed to have offered constant devotion to the Black Madonna, and in two of the cases, specific requests were made for the favour of a child. In all cases, the prayers were answered. The proud parents, it should be the loving duty of every parishioner to make a special thanksgiving. The Father Rector will be grateful for any further information. Look, Raymond, said Lou, read this. They decided to put in for a baby to the Black Madonna. The following Saturday, when they drove to the church for benediction, Lou jangled her rosary. Raymond pulled up outside the church. Look here, Lou, he said. Do you want a baby in any case? For the part for he partly thought she was only putting the Black Madonna to the test. Do you want a child after all these years? This was a new thought to Lou. She considered her neat, flat and tidy routine, the entertaining with her good coffee cups, the weekly papers and the library books, the tastes which they would not have been able to cultivate had they had a family of children. She thought of her nice young looks, which everyone envied, and her freedom of movement. Perhaps we should try, she said. God won't give us a child if we weren't meant to have one. 
We have to make some decisions for ourselves, he said. And to tell you the truth, if you don't want a child, I don't. There's no harm in praying for one, she said. You have to be careful what you pray for, he said. You mustn't tempt providence. She thought of her relatives and Raymond's, all married with children. She thought of her sister Elizabeth with her eight and remembered that one who that one who cheeked up to the teachers so pretty and sulky and shabby. And she remembered the fat baby Francis sucking his dummy and clutching Elizabeth's bony neck. I don't see why I shouldn't have a baby, said Lou. Oxford St. John departed at the end of the month. He promised to write, but they were not surprised when weeks passed and they had no word. I don't suppose we shall ever hear from him again, said Lou. Raymond thought he detected satisfaction in her voice and would have thought she was getting snobbish, as women do as they get older. Losing sight of their ideas, had she not gone on to speak of Henry Pierce? Henry had written to say he was nearly cured, but had been advised to return to the West Indies. We must go and see him, said Lou. We promised. What about the Sunday after next? OK, said Raymond. It was the Sunday before that Sunday when Lou had her first sick turn. She struggled out of bed to attend benediction, but had to leave suddenly during the service and was sick behind the church in the presbytery yard. Raymond took her home, though she protested against cutting out her rosary to the Black Madonna. After only six weeks, she said, and she could hardly tell whether her sickness was due to excitement or nature. Only six weeks ago, she said, and her voice had a touch of its old Liverpool. Did we go to the Black Madonna and the prayers answered, see? Raymond looked at her, at her in awe as she held the bowl for her sickness. Are you sure? he said. She was well enough next day to go to visit Henry in the sanatorium. He was fatter and, she thought, a little coarser. And though in his manner, as if once having been nearly disembodied, he was not going to let it happen again. He was leaving the country very soon. He promised to come and see them before he left. Lou barely skimmed through his next letter before handing it over to Raymond. The visitors now were ordinary white ones. Not so colourful, Raymond said, as Henry and Oxford were. Then he looked embarrassed lest he should seem to be making a joke about the word coloured. Do you miss the niggers? said Tina Farrell, and Lou forgot to correct her. Lou gave up most of her church work in order to sew and knit for the baby. Raymond gave up the Reader's Digest. He applied for promotion and got it. He became a department manager. The flat was now a waiting room for next summer after the baby was born when they would put down the money for a house. They hoped for one of the new houses and a building site on the outskirts of the town. We shall need a garden, Lou explained to her friends. I'll join the mother's union, she thought. Meantime, the spare bedroom was turned into a nursery. Raymond made a cot regardless that some of the neighbours complained of the hammering. Lou prepared a cradle, trimmed it with frills. She wrote to her relatives. She wrote to Elizabeth, sent her five pounds and gave notice that there would be no further weekly payments, seeing that they now need every penny. She doesn't require it anyway, said Raymond. The welfare state looks after people like Elizabeth. And he told Lou about the contraceptives he thought he had seen on the table by the double bed. Lou became very excited about this. How did you know they were contraceptives? What did they look like? Why didn't you tell me before? What a she calling herself a Catholic. Do you think she has a man then? Raymond was sorry he had mentioned the subject. Don't worry, dear. Don't upset yourself, dear. 
and she told me she goes to Mass every Sunday, and all the kids go except James. No wonder he's got into trouble with an example like that. I might have known with her peroxide hair, a pound a week, and I've been sending up to now. That's fifty-two pounds a year. I would never have done it, calling herself a Catholic with birth control by her bedside. Don't upset yourself, dear. Lou prayed to the Black Madonna three times a week for a safe delivery and a healthy child. She gave her story to the Father Rector who announced it in the next parish magazine. Another case has come to light of the kindly favour of our Black Madonna towards a childless couple. Lou recited her rosary before the statue until it was difficult for her to kneel and when she stood could not see her feet. The mother of God with her black bog oaken drapery, her high black cheekbones and square hands looked more virginal than ever to Lou as she stood counting her beads in front of her stomach. She said to Raymond, if it's a girl we must have Mary as one of the names, but not the first name, it's too ordinary. Please yourself dear, said Raymond. The doctor had told him it might be a difficult birth. Thomas, if it's a boy, she said, after my uncle, but if it's a girl, I'd like something fancy for a first name. He thought, loose lipping, she didn't used to say that word, fancy. What about Dawn, she said, I like the sound of Dawn. Then Mary for a second name, Dawn Mary Parker, it sounds sweet. Dawn. That's not a Christian name, he said. Then he told her, just as you please, dear. Or Thomas Parker, she said. She had decided to go into the maternity wing of the hospital like everyone else. But near the time, she let Raymond change her mind since he kept saying, at your age, dear, it might be more difficult than for the younger women. Better book a private ward, we'll manage the expense. In fact, it was a very easy birth, a girl. Raymond was allowed in to see Lou in the late afternoon. She was half asleep. The nurse will take you to see the baby in the nursery ward, she told him. She's lovely, but terribly red. They're always red at birth, said Raymond. He met the nurse in the corridor. Any chance of seeing the baby? My wife said... She looked flustered. I'll get the sister, she said. Oh, I don't want to give any trouble. Only my wife said, that's all right. We're here, Mr. Parker. The sister appeared a tall, grave woman. Raymond thought her to be short-sighted, for she seemed to look at him fairly closely before she bade him follow her. The baby was round and very red with dark curly hair. Fancy her having hair. I thought they were born bald, said Raymond. They sometimes have hair at birth, said the sister. She's very red in colour. Raymond began comparing his child with those in the other cots, far more so than the others. Oh, that will wear off. Next day, he found Lou in a half stupor. She had been given a strong sedative following an attack of screaming hysteria. He sat by her bed, bewildered. Presently, a nurse beckoned him from the door. Will you have a word with Matron? Your wife is upset about her baby, said the matron. You see, the colour... She's a beautiful baby, perfect. It's a question of the colour. I noticed the baby was red, said Raymond. But the nurse said, oh, the red will go. It changes, you know, but the baby will certainly be brown. If not indeed black, as indeed we think she will be. A beautiful, healthy child. Black, said Raymond. Yes, indeed we think so. Indeed, I must say, certainly so, said the matron. Who did not expect your wife to take it so badly when we told her. 
We've had plenty of dark babies here, but most of the mothers expect it. There must be a mix-up. You must have mixed up the babies, said Raymond. There's no question of mix-up, said the matron sharply. We'll soon settle that. We've had some of that before. But neither of us are dark, said Raymond. You've seen my wife, you see me. That's something you must work out for yourselves. I'd have a word with the doctor if I were you, but whatever conclusion you come to, please don't upset your wife at this stage. She had already refused to feed the child, says it isn't hers, which is ridiculous. Was it Oxford St. John? said Raymond. Raymond, the doctor told you not to come here upsetting me. I'm feeling terrible. Was it Oxford St. John? Clear out of here, you swine, saying things like that. He demanded to be taken to see the baby, as he had done every day for a week. The nurses were gathered round it, neglecting the squalling whites and the other cots for the sight of their darling black. She was indeed quite black, with a woolly crop of untiny negroid nostrils. She had been baptised that morning, though not in her parents' presence. One of the nurses had stood as godmother. The nurses dispersed in a flurry as Raymond approached. He looked hard at the baby. It looked black with its black button eyes. He saw the name tab round its neck, Dawn Mary Parker. He got hold of a nurse in the corridor. Look here, you just take that name Parker off that child's neck. The name's not Parker. It isn't my child. The nurse said, get away, we're busy. There's just a chance, said the doctor to Raymond, that if there's ever been black blood in your family or your wives, it's coming out now. It's a very long chance. I've never known it happen in my experience, but I've heard of cases. It, I could read them up to you. There's nothing like that in my family, said Raymond. He thought of Lou, the obscure Liverpool antecedents. The parents had died before he had met Lou. It could be several generations back, said the doctor. Raymond went home avoiding the neighbours who would stop him to inquire after Lou. He rather regretted smashing up the cot in his first fury. That was something low coming out in him. But again, when he thought of the tiny black hands of the baby with their pink fingernails, he did not regret smashing the cot. He was successful in tracing the whereabouts of Oxford St. John. Even before he heard the result of Oxford's Oxford's blood test, he said to Lou, write and ask your relations if there's been any black blood in the family. Write and ask yours, she said. She refused to look at the black baby. The nurses fussed round it all day and came to report its progress to Lou. Pull yourself together, Mrs Parker. She's a lovely child. You must care for your infant said the priest. You don't know what I'm suffering, Lou said. In the name of God, said the priest, if you're a Catholic Christian, you've got to expect to suffer. I can't go against my nature, said Lou. I can't be expected to... Raymond said to her one day in the following week, the blood tests are all right, the doctor says. What do you mean all right? Oxford's blood and the babies don't tally and... Oh, shut up, she said. The baby's black and your blood test can't make it white. No, he said. He had, fallen, he had fallen out with his mother, though his inquiries, whether there, through his inquiries, whether there had been coloured blood in his family. The doctor says, he said, that these black mixtures sometimes occur in seaport towns. It might have been generations back. One thing, said Lou, I'm not going to take that child back to the flat. You'll have to, he said. Elizabeth wrote, wrote her a letter which Raymond intercepted. 
Dear Lou, Raymond is asking if I have any blacks in the family. Well, that's funny you have a coloured goddess not asleep. There was that Finn cousin, Tommy, at Liverpool. He was very dark. They put it down to the past. A Negro off a ship that would be, that would be before our late mother's time. God rest her soul. She would turn her grave. You, you should have kept up your bit to me. What's a pound a week to you? It was on our father's side, the colour, and Mary Finn, you remember, at the diary, at the dairy, was dark, remember? Her hair was like Negro hair. It must be black. Back in the olden days, the Negro, some ancestor, but it is only nature. I thank the Almighty it has missed my kids, and your hubby must think it was that Negro you were showing off when you came to my place. I wish you all the best as a widow with kids. You should send my money as per usual. Your effect, sister Elizabeth. I gather from Elizabeth, said Raymond to Lou, that there was some element of colour in your family. Of course, you couldn't be expected to know about it. I do think, though, that some kind of record should be kept. Oh, shut up, said Lou. The baby's black and nothing can make it white. Two days before Lou two days before Lou left the hospital she had a visitor, although she had given instructions that no one except Raymond should be let in to see her. This lapse she attributed to the nasty curiosity of the nurses, for it was Henry Pierce come to say goodbye before embarkation. He stayed less than five minutes. Why, Mrs Parker, your visitor didn't stay long, said the nurse. No, I soon got rid of him. I thought I made it clear to you that I didn't want to see anyone. You shouldn't have left him in. Let him in. Oh, sorry, Mrs Parker, but the young gentleman looked so upset when we told him so. He said he was going abroad and it was his last chance. He might ever see you again. He said, how's the baby? And we said, tip top. I know what's in your mind, said Lou, but it isn't true. I've got the blood tests. Oh, Mrs. Parker, I wouldn't suggest for a minute. She must have went with one of their niggers that used to come. Lou could never be sure if that was what she heard from the doorways and landings as she climbed the stairs at Cripp's house, the neighbours hushing their conversation as she approached. I can't take to the child, try as I do, I simply can't even like it. Nor me, said Raymond. Mind you, if it was anyone else's child, I would think it was all right. It's just the thought of it being mine, and people think it isn't. That's just it, she said. One of Raymond's colleagues had asked him that day how his friends Oxford and Henry were getting on. Raymond had to look twice before he decided that the question was innocent. But one never knew. Already Lou and Raymond had approached the Adoption Society. It was now only a matter of waiting for word. If that child was mine, said Tina Farrell, I'd never part with her. I wish we could afford to adopt another. She's the loveliest little darkie in the world. You wouldn't think so, said Lou, if she really was yours. Imagine it for yourself, waking up to find you had a black baby that everyone thinks has a nigger for his father. It would be a shock, Tina said and tittered. We've got the blood tests, said Lou quickly. Raymond got a transfer to London. They got word about the adoption very soon. We've done the right thing, said Lou. Even the priest had to agree with that, considering how strongly we felt against keeping the child. Oh, he said it was a good thing? No, not a good thing. In fact, he said it would have been a good thing if we could have kept the baby. But failing that, we did the right thing. Apparently, there's a difference. The Black Madonna by Muriel Spark. Do let me know what, what you think about this story. I would be really interested to hear what part of the story you focused on, what aspect of the story you focused on, and what your reaction was as the story progressed.
I'd be really, really interested to hear that. Do let me know what you thought and how you feel about um, uh, the decision not to keep the baby. Lou and Raymond's decision not to keep the baby. A difficult story to read, actually, um, although it has very sort of comical parts. Well, thanks very much for listening and see you next time.